Live from the internet, it's the Dr. Tom the Frog Show! Hi ho, this is the Dr. Tom the Frog Show, and I'm Dr. Tom the Frog, and here we talk about role-playing games! I am super excited because today we have a very special guest. We have Michael Prescott. How are you doing, Michael Prescott? I'm pretty good. How are you, Dr. Tom? Oh, man. I uh, I got to tell you, my son, Lil Mott, he had to leave school sick yesterday. <laughs> he was a little green around the gills. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's okay, though. He, he mostly just wanted to play video games. Does that hey, work into your medical practice, then? You can uh, use your skills at home? Uh, mostly, yeah. I just write it off. It's, it's a tax break. So, <laughs> hey... Michael, I heard that you used to get bugged by the paparazzi. Uh, the story goes that you punched a reporter right in the nose. Uh, I have no memory of that. I deny everything. Oh, uh, well, all the same. I'm sure the press got what it deserved. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> nice, yeah. I've heard you were uh, yeah, quite the atrocious punster. All right, thank you. Uh, Pee Wee Rhoda and, and Paul Edson are on my writing team along with others, so I, I'm armed to bear or to frog. Hey, nice. So I understand uh, that you've got a blog and a Patreon or a Patreon or whatever the heck you call it. Uh, and you do a one-page Don Juans. What is that? A, a quick seduction game? It is. It's uh, You try and see how many uh, people you can pick up in 750 words or less. Oh, man. Well, I would imagine that uh, really once you've Don Juan, you've done them all. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I do. Um, it, it started some time ago... Um, it's now run by, uh, uh, well, it was run by Alex Schroeder, and it's the One Page Dungeon Contest. And a friend of mine, Michael Atlin, who's uh, been a longtime member of my local gaming group, we were like, hey, let's enter this, and we did that in 2012, and it didn't really go anywhere. But um, a few years later, I was handed some playtest documents for Torchbearer, which you may know is like a, a real super intense dungeon crawling game. And uh, part of that was, you know, I got to bust out the old graph paper and, and make some dungeons. And for whatever reason, my, my home group doesn't normally incline to dungeon crawling kind of stuff, but I've had this yen for it built up over the years. And I just started drawing and sketching and stocking these dungeons like I did when I was nine years old. And I decided I was going to do all 666 layers of the abyss. And I just kept going and um, entered the one page dungeon contest again and, and you know, got a mention, and uh, I just I just got the bug, and eventually, when I heard about Patreon, I thought, why not throw it up there? And uh, and people have responded pretty well to it, so it's it's been really uh, really gratifying and just a just a blast, really. Oh man, these these things are really pretty. I I have to say, so have you always been an artist? Um, not by training. I mean, there's you know, when you try and draw people, they all look pretty strange. But um, I've done. You know, notebook drawing for a long time, and just kind of pecked away at, at things, and you know, draw shapeless monsters which don't have human anatomy problems. Um, a few years ago, a friend of mine said, you know, he saw me drawing while we were playing a session, and he asked me to start illustrating his uh, uh, fan-made Warhammer fantasy roleplay supplements that he did through Libra Fanatica, and it just again sort of got the bug and started to sharpen my skills a little bit. So when it came time to draw the dungeons, it seemed natural to do them as illustrations rather than and 2D maps. Although that has some, you know, has its own problems trying to do things that way. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I, I yeah, I, I'm not really much of an artist. I, I, you know, if you can't do humans, you could always try frogs. I mean, Juan Ochoa made a pretty fine looking fellow right there. We'll have to set a session. You can uh, you can pose for me. Oh, 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 man. I see that. See that, Rogers? Oh, man. He's jealous. Okay. Hey, now I've got a question, though. I'm a little confused about these one page dungeons. Now, I understand that it's a one page dungeon, but what if I want to play as a knight or more than one player wants to be a page? What do you do? Right. No, there's no, there's no pages involved unless you bring one yourself. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different role-playing games people play. D&D is obviously very popular, and as I mentioned, Torchbearer and Dungeon World. And there's so many good games to play um, that to, to put an adventure idea on one page, there's no room for stats, really. And um, I'm not so much interested in cranking out adventures for games where you have detailed stat blocks and it takes a long time to figure out if you've got balanced monsters or not. So it, it's just a way to take a whole bunch of ideas that will hopefully generate something interesting at the table and squeeze them around the margins of an illustration, um, which is the map. 
That's really cool. And then after the Patreon, after something gets funded, you just put it up on your blog free of charge for, for all the like no accounts and uh, the scatabouts to just uh, come and steal. It's not, it's not the, what you're talking about is the ransom method where, you know, you got to get a certain amount of money before it gets released to everybody. I, I don't actually do it that way. Um, I, I'm not sure it would really work for me. What I do is I just put it up on the blog first and then I post about it on Patreon. So actually there's no, there's no ransom. I was doing this slightly before I was doing a Patreon. They're all free. Um, there's lots of great adventures out there. Um, and it, it didn't make sense to try and, uh, sell something first. I thought I'd just put it out and let the product stand as a, as its own marketing. I, I gotta ask you, do you have any new ones? Like I understand maybe you, you might be ready to preview a little bit of a, something that you're working sure, on now. Sure. Well, I mean, I gotta tell you before you, you know, I sent you some of the images, but there's, um, my process is often is very uneven. Like I, you know, I got a couple kids, I got family and job and all these kinds of things. And, and for me, this, this is squeezed in the margins. And so I, I find I'm extremely inspiration led. So what'll happen is I'll start to sketch something and then I'll leave it and I'll pick it up a few months later. Um, so these are, these are some ideas that I've had in my notebook kind of burning a hole in page 28 for a little while now, and they're going to make their way out over the next few months. Cool. Okay. Let's see. Um, I'm going to, uh, Rogers, get to the sharing of the thing. Okay. He's going to click some buttons. All right. There you go. All right. All right yeah, so, yeah. so what's what's this that we're looking at here? So Michael? It's, it's hard to see because it's in blue pencil. I do that so that when I scan it, I can back out the pencil work. But this is, um, I mean, mostly you can see perspective reference. But I thought it, this started as a visual. There's a fantastic artist. His name is Jeff Brown. And he does these kind of sketchy, digitally, painterly kind of um uh, concept art and he had a piece that that just took my breath away it's this kind of rough hewn uh, rectilinear fortress just sitting on a hillside and I was like uh, he was selling it and I, and I bought it and I've used that as my inspiration for this one so this is um, it's a you can't really make it out but that very vertical piece towards the bottom is is a lock so um, it's one of those it's kind of a, a double set of gates that allows uh, boats to oh, yeah, I see that. Uh, you know, right there, it like opens up. Yeah, yep, it's like Panama. Right. Yeah, right? yeah, it makes me think of Van Halen. You should listen yep. to Van Halen. Yep. So there's no actually great story associated with this. As I said, a lot of the time the inspiration is visual. So I don't know what I'm going to stick in that castle, but you know, in my mind, it has. Um, uh, it's a it's a place of great strategic value. It's it's huge. It's built for people much larger than humans. Um, and it's changed hands many times, and so it'll have all the scars associated with a whole bunch of wars um, and all sorts of leftover interesting gadgets from earlier ages. Yeah, that's one thing I and really like about your dungeons is how they they feel lived in. Like, they, there's definite, um, yeah, like, organic feel to them. So what's this that we're looking at here? All right, so this is... Is that a spaceship? It's, yeah, I mean, it's, in my mind, it's kind of a brass UFO-shaped building about, you know, this, I don't know, maybe three, 400 yards across. But this is, as I've been doing this, I've found that I've mined ideas that I've had in my head a long time and haven't really had any kind of expression for. So for some reason, I've had this idea a long time of a, of a sinkhole. I, I seem to love sinkholes. Um, with a community of wizards that lived in the top. And there's this kind of a very straightforward um, income division. You know, the wizards are the top. They, they have the best of everything. Uh, but their world is dead. So if you can see around the top edge there, there's, there's basically a mountain range, and there's just kind of this white flickering sky. Um, and, and, of course, it's, it's all fallen to ruin, um, which is true of so many of the really interesting places to explore. But this was like an attempt to get that idea out of my head onto paper. And... We'll see how it works out, but my thinking is that this will be a mega dungeon of some kind. So each of these little locations, there's a, a little island at the bottom with a fort on it. In the center, there's a floating tower. At the top, there's that brass UFO. And down on the bottom right, there's, there's an old crypt. There's basically like a meeting place of all these different civilizations. So this will give me a chance to, to stitch maybe five or six adventures together into some kind of cohesive thing. And, and the way I see it is, again, it's just a visual. There's no kind of cultural backstory here other than um, the wizards managed to mess up their planet ecologically and have, have basically moved on. And, and this is populated with, you know, whatever monstrous survivors of all sorts of different kinds. But I like the idea that the adventures are, are coming underground. They've, they've gone through some tremendously long tunnel and then they emerge in this underground tomb in the bottom right. And then, then they get this visual of the vista, this huge, huge column of air that rises up um, and I don't know, we'll see how it translates into the ink. As I said, the inspiration for me is so often visual, and then I fill it up with stuff afterwards. 
Nice. I see here you've got a barrel, so all someone has to do is destroy that because there's always treasure in barrels. That's right, yes. Learned that from video games, so that one that one I've got down pat. <laughs> now, this, this third one here, this is, looks like it's a lot a lot farther in progress here. You draw some giant birds. These are some pretty nice-looking birds, by the way. What's going yeah. on here? So this is, this is going to be my entry for the one-page dungeon contest. I'm calling it the Skyblind Spire. And it is a, uh, you know, it's one of these classic crazy wizard places. So his gimmick is that he uh, was trying to control a lake spirit. So in the in this kind of world, there's a lot of uh, elemental forces that are part of, you know, great forests and mountains and things like that, um, or ancestral hosts. And one of the bad habits that wizards have is trying to extract as much energy from these things as possible. So he builds this crazy tower whose strange interlocking rooms are all about casting a spell but in architectural form so of course he's fallen out of a window long before he was able to get any benefit out of the spell so the tower is now gone fallow and uh in the upper rooms you can see a bunch of dire pelicans have moved in and and um, i had to draw some essentially giant pigeons in another adventure uh which wasn't for me it was for uh, brendan davis who's got a wonderful game coming out called uh, wandering heroes of ogre gate and i've, I've had some really fun times putting together 3D maps for them. Um, and this is what's happening here. So I've got, yeah, this is the Skyblind Spire. So you can see here is basically my uh, SketchUp model. So um, I do this for a perspective reference. I, I do it all in cyan so I can print it out and draw over top of it and scan it and then back out the, uh, the cyan maquette. Um, so yeah, that's just a bunch of really- I knew a girl named Cyan Maquette. She was pretty nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, did she show up in photographs? No, she didn't. You, it was just like she wasn't even there. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, so, uh, I mean, uh, Scrap Princess, I posted some of these online, and Scrap Princess weighed in with some videos of pelicans being absolute bastards, because they just are. They One of them's eating a pigeon that people are feeding in the park, and it just takes forever to eat the thing, and it just makes me think of Rollmaster Criticals. Just you know, never mind suffocating in D6 rounds. It's just you're breaking bones and limbs, and I don't know, turning inside out. It's gross. Oh yeah, that's, that's uh, Rollmaster and Arduin critical hit tables. Those are nasty stuff. Yes. Yes. All right, man. That that is really cool. I I love how you kind of layer this stuff in. It's so intricate. It's really in the 3D dungeons. There's just there's so few of those. It it's is great. like there's a there's a well, I've learned a couple tricks. Um, as I said, there's some there's some disadvantage to this, and one of the th requests that I occasionally get is people say, "I'd love a 2D version so I could put it on my uh, virtual tabletop," because um, obviously an isometric map doesn't work there. But but I go the other route of just trying to really inspire someone who's going to run it and give them a sense of what the place looks like. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, I'm all for the 3D. I mean, sure, they want to be able to like have their hex map, but yeah. come on. <laughs> The other thing I've found is that it, it makes it hard to collaborate. I've had some uh, great collaborators over the couple of years that I've been doing this. And um, because the layout is so demanding in terms of just trying to nestle the, the text into every nook and cranny, I've had to rip whole paragraphs out just because of you know one word wraps the wrong way and I then have to reword everything else. So that, that makes it extremely hard to work closely with... Um, you know, with someone else contributing. So I found it, it works great at the idea stage. Um, and it, then I have to take the text to the end on my own pretty much. Yeah. You probably, you probably have a dog ear thesaurus at back over there, huh? Yeah. Well, they're online now, but definitely. All right. Awesome. Okay. Well, this, this is amazing, Michael. Thank you for the, the preview and the, and the little bit there. I, I look forward to seeing your entry to the one page dungeon. I, I think though that it is time for a serious question. Are you ready for a serious question, Michael? I'll see. I'll have to okay. summon my serious answers. All right. Get your serious face on. You get your okay. burning wheel shirt. You're, you're all serious eyes. Yeah. Okay. If, if you could live in any fantasy RPG world, which would you choose and why? You know, I think I'm going to have to say Greyhawk. And the reason is, is that it is one of the enduring sources of inspiration to me. I probably get killed immediately. Um, you know, just, just running afoul of some second level thug. But, um, you know, just those early hex maps, the, uh, seeing them as a kid, I didn't even own these things. I, I still don't. Um, and I've never played in Greyhawk officially, but but um, those hex maps that just said every inch of this world is covered in adventure, um, you know, the land beyond the magic mirror, all those interesting places that just said adventure is underneath every single rock 
um, I, I would have to go with uh, Greyhawk just for the pure childhood nostalgia of it. That's that's awesome. I would I would go with Greyhawk probably just specifically to give a high five to Bigby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got to watch those. Nice. Well, Michael, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your dungeons uh, with us. It was really great having you on the Dr. Tom the Frog Show. Thanks for having me, and I hope your son feels better soon. <laughs> hey, you hear that, little Mark? All right. Cool. Thank you. You just watched the Dr. Tom the Frog Show, and we hope that you liked what you saw, yo. But if it was a big waste of your time, well, it's free, so that's not a crime. But if it was a waste of your time, yes, it's free, so that's not a crime.